So in these weeks, we're looking at Luke's gospel starting in chapter four. And today in Luke, we come to an encounter between Jesus and Simon's mother-in-law. Mother-in-laws have had a bad press recently. The comedian Les Dawson made a career out of making jokes about his mother-in-law, like this one. I just got back from a pleasure trip. I took, I took my mother-in-law to the airport and so on. That was one of the milder ones. According to last week's Mail on Sunday, I don't know if you read the Mail on Sunday, but the Mail on Sunday last week said Les wasn't always off the mark. Researchers in America believe people may be unconsciously biased in favor of their own mothers due to a genetic conflict that makes them act unconsciously in the interests of their own kin. The study found that both men and women had more conflict with their mothers-in-law than their mothers, and mothers indicated having more conflict with their daughters-in-law than their daughters. They found the most common reason for a row with a mother-in-law was about criticism about money or the way that the grandchildren were being brought up, if you have echoes of these things. For me, however, my late mother-in-law was an inspirational Christian woman. Not only was she a mother of eight, eight, I married into a big family, but a woman who even with that considerable demand offered hospitality to people who were sometimes left out to outsiders and she would bring them into the home and um, bring to them Christian care. She was a woman full of laughter and music. A woman who learned Russian in her 60s so she could communicate with and encourage Christians in Russia. And in the process, she converted her Russian teacher, who was quite an important academic when she was in Russia, uh, Natasha, and um, she's in her late 90s now, but she became part of our family because she was converted um, in teaching Russian to my mother-in-law. So my mother-in-law was not a pain, but an inspiration. And it seems that Simon Peter's mother-in-law may well have been an inspiration for his discipleship to Jesus. In Mark, the call of the first four disciples, Simon and Andrew, James and John, comes earlier. So that Jesus going to the disciples' house and performing a healing is at the request of his new disciples. But here in Luke, the delay calls the four, um, the call of the four doesn't happen until after the healing of Simon's mother-in-law. And so it seems that the effect of the miracle had something deep in Simon Peter's life. And maybe it was that that made him follow Jesus. He grants to Jesus hospitality. And when we welcome Jesus into our homes, amazing things happen. And this is what the story tells us. Here in Luke, Jesus, rather than taking Simon's mother-in-law by the hand, stands over her, and in echoes of the earlier exorcism, the fever, we're told the fever holds her, and Jesus rebukes the fever, just as he rebuked the demon in the man in the synagogue. The fever then is released from her, and it uses the same verbal root for release as it did in the story that Derek covered last week of the man in the synagogue. The completeness of this healing and restoration is amazing. We've just been saying we've got an amazing God, and um, there's an amazing healing here that clears the way for the full blessing of God and shows that Jesus' kingdom, God's kingdom, has come. It seems likely that Luke is making Simon's mother-in-law's healing more like the synagogue exorcism, so that Jesus does two of the same sort of miracle in the same day. It's a long day, by the way. He's a, a busy man. The healings are back to back. The healing of a man and then the healing of a woman. Especially in Luke's gospel, men and women are shown as being equal recipients of God's grace and equal participants in the community of Jesus' followers. Luke shapes this teaching of male-female pairs throughout the gospel in order to make a point. For instance, Jesus mentions the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the leper 
in order to make a point in Luke 4, 25 to 27. And then in Luke 17, Jesus mentions two men on the couch and two women grinding at the mill. In Luke 11, Jesus uses the example of Jonah and the Queen of Sheba as signs. The American New Testament scholar, Ben Witherington III, says, it's only Americans who have names like that, I think, Ben Witherington III. Sadly, it seems that some, he says, when Luke wrote this gospel, it's likely that the very reason he felt a need to stress male-female parallelism, parallelism and Jesus' positive statements about women was that his own audience has strong reservations about some of Jesus' views on the subject. Sadly, it seems that some Christians, despite Jesus' teaching and Luke's writing, still have strong reservations concerning the equality and mutuality of women and men in the community of Jesus' followers. So Jesus goes, we're told, straight from the synagogue to Simon's home. Jesus has healed in the synagogue, in the place of worship, where God's presence might be expected. But in the second Capernaum account, we see that Jesus also heals in the home. Now, often we think of God being present here in the church, don't we? You know, we come to church and hopefully, hopefully we expect that God's here and that his spirit is here and that we'll be blessed and challenged and renewed and all sorts of things happen to us when we come into the presence of God. But God is also there in our homes. Jesus goes to the home. We note that Jesus placed a special emphasis on homes as a place of healing and hope. There are over 50 instances of Jesus' ministry in homes across the whole of the four Gospels. Even later in his ministry, Jesus began to move away from his primary ministry in the synagogue and in public spaces and to move to more towards the home. Jesus used the home to build relationships and to heal others, thus allowing him to demonstrate power and truth. He used the opportunities in homes through the relationships and miracles to teach on matters of faith and grace. If we were to say it in a way that includes the modern day believer, we would say that Jesus being present in our home makes it a place of intimacy and safety, of forgiveness and healing, of restored relationships and of renewed hope. Homes become a place where God heals us, where God speaks to us. Now I'm aware, because I've been a minister for a long time, that lots of things happen behind closed doors and that life at home for some is not easy. Whether it's handling children, because that can be difficult, or whether it's problems in relationships, or whether there, there are other difficulties there with money, with family. There's all kinds of things which happen in our homes. And so it's important for us to know that God can give us strength and help us in these situations, that God is as much there in our home as he is with us here in the church. And Jesus went to the homes. He went to the homes, and he still comes to our home to be there. And it's great to know, isn't it? Especially in these days when we spend so much time at home, that Jesus is there in our home. One final word about this mother-in-law. As soon as she was released from the grip of the fever, what did she do? Immediately, we read, she rose and she served them, served all the people who were there. The word translated serve is the word that we would use for deacon, diaconio. In fact, Simon Peter's mother-in-law was the first person to minister to Jesus in Luke's gospel. In Christian circles, there's a custom of inviting people home for lunch after the morning service. That's not a hint. As a visiting minister, I was often wary of this because you would go and you would preach in a church and you didn't really know the people and you'd be invited out for lunch because there was usually an evening service in these days, so you had to stay on 
you get invited for lunch and you sit down, you'd be out to eat your soup and they would ask you, are you a pre-millennialist or a post-millennialist? Or questions similar to that. I really was asked that, so I'm not making it up. So, or you would get a dissection of your sermon. What was that you were saying? And you'd have to defend yourself or whatever. I remember as a young person, I'd often go to the brethren for their evening service because you'd get invited out afterwards and you got the best sandwiches and cakes if you went to a brethren church. Anybody done that? It's true, isn't it? They had marvelous suppers. However, in Jesus' time, it was not the custom to invite people home on, your, on the Sabbath. And all food had to be prepared the day before. It wasn't prepared on the day. So this, um, there's a bit of rule breaking going on here in this story. It's actually slightly more shocking than it would appear as we just come to it at the start. The rules are broken because Simon's mother-in-law just wants to express her gratitude right away. And suddenly she's got all these people in the home. And what does she do? Such is her indebtedness to Jesus that she responds to Jesus with gratitude and service. Gratitude and service seem to me to be the identifying characteristics of those of us who have had an encounter with Jesus. If we meet with Jesus and we find all the things that Jesus can do in our lives, his forgiveness, his restoring, his healing, the life that he gives us, the purpose which he sets before us, all of these things should be met with gratitude and thankfulness. And when we develop a, an attitude of gratitude, like that, an attitude of gratitude in our lives, when we develop a thankfulness in all that we're doing, it gives us a strength. It gives us a strength through the hard times, the difficult times, the bad times, if we're thankful for what God has given us and what God has done. So when we meet these difficult times, and we always will, we've got that strength of being thankful and grateful. And so Simon's mother-in-law responds with this thankfulness. For the rest of what was another long day in the life of Jesus, we're told that even as evening was coming, he was still healing people in Capernaum. Jesus healed people, and he brought about exorcisms from the demons, and they were confessing him as the Messiah. And he told them to be quiet. Luke shows Jesus being cautious here and responsible, because if he claimed to be a Messiah at this stage in his ministry, he would be put to death, and so he wouldn't be able to develop his disciples and do the things which he needed to do. Because we learn from his life, as well as from his death, and from his resurrection, and all these three we hold together. And so from synagogue to home, from man to woman, the amazing power of Jesus meets with us where we are and who we are. And we are called to reciprocate with gratitude and with service. So see what you can be thankful for this week. It's good to think what can I be thankful for in my life this week? There's a target for you. Just what can you give thanks for? Maybe it's a little bird up in a tree that you spot. I like the bullfinches, which you saw this week. There are all kinds of things that we can be thankful for. Maybe it's because you're loved and cared for in your family. Or maybe, I don't know, there's lots of things. I like food. There's all kinds of things, and coffee. But we can be thankful for the small things or the big things. But to develop that attitude of thankfulness gives us the strength we need in times of trouble. Peter, can you play as we come to communion? Thank you. <clears throat> 